Patterns. They're everywhere. Patterns in behavior, diet, speech, and nature. And it's here in nature that I discovered there are five main patterns or visible consistencies. There's the spiral, which you can see in spiraled galaxies. The meander, which is evident in meandering sand dunes or brain coral. Explosion, we see with ice crystal formations. Packing, as it relates to clusters of grapes. And branching, as in lightning or, of course, the branches of trees. Now, when I read that there were five main patterns in nature, I remembered a strange connection, or a pattern, if you will, with the number five. This is how my brain works. That's attached to this, this is attached to that, which triggers a witch call it, and so forth and so on. I needed to see if there was a connection between the number five and where I was going with this pattern thing. The number five memory sent me rambling through old files until I found a speech that I'd written for a presentation back in 2019. Now, I'm not sure if it'll qualify as a pattern, but it's certainly a peculiarity. Do you know about the number five? It's been trying to get our attention for a very long time. So we've got the five main patterns in nature, but here's where things get interesting. Five is also the number of balance. We have five fingers, five toes, and five senses. There are five days in the work week, five vowels in the English alphabet, and five arms to a starfish. There are five books of God's law, five pillars of Islam, five principles of Buddha, five barrows of Manhattan, and five Jacksons. There are five epochs of civilization, five elements in Western alchemy, five in Chinese philosophy. There are five stages of grief, five guys named Mo, and when cut horizontally, an apple has five seeds in the shape of a five-pointed star. That's a lot to chew on. Could you go away for a million dollars? All of that brings me to 1965 and a British physician and psychoanalyst named Elliot Jacks. Mr. Jacks is credited with inventing the phrase midlife crisis. He did this in a paper he published called Death and the Midlife Crisis. In it, Jax described the midlife crisis as a period in which we come face to face with our limitations, our restricted possibilities, and our mortality. In researching this piece, I was simply trying to figure out whether or not the midlife crisis was still a thing, a spiritual reckoning, or just a social construct for those with the benefit of enough time on their hands to ponder their life's journey. As it turns out, it might be something so much bigger. Let's look at 1965. The average life expectancy in Western countries was 70 years old, which was a significant change from the turn of the century when the life expectancy for a man was 52 years old. In 1965, America was still mourning the loss of JFK just two years before in November of 63. The Vietnam War was grinding into its 10th year. The civil rights movement was in full bore. Martin Luther King Jr. led the 50-mile march into Selma, Alabama. Malcolm X had just been assassinated. The Gemini 4 space mission conducted the first spacewalk. The universe was expanding right before our eyes. We had the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the birth control pill was legal nationwide in the United States. Women began working. They gained financial independence and shifted the institution of marriage. In looking back, it's as though our entire country was experiencing a midlife crisis, a once-in-a-lifetime cultural shift. Or was it something else? An awakening. An awakening that's happened before. And just like with nature in our favorite number five, part of a recurring pattern. Two men, William Strauss and Neil Howe, believe it was. And when you read their book, it's hard to argue. They are the authors of a provocative book with an incredibly long title, The Fourth Turning, An American Prophecy, What the Cycles of History Tell Us About America's Next Rendezvous with Destiny. It's a mouthful. And there's no way I'm going to break all 400 pages down into this little essay here, but here's the theory in a nutshell. Strauss and Hal went back through 500 years of history and discovered a repeating pattern. Modern history has been following a cycle. Every 80 or 90 years, or roughly the period of one long human life, 
a great civic upheaval occurs. They conclude that these upheavals occur because as a generation ages, it loses what they call generational memory. Basically, it forgets how to run a government from the top down and create and manage institutions that actually work. We have to relearn how to do it during a period of crisis. And they break each 80-year cycle down further into four 20-year blocks, or turnings, hence the name. The first 20 years, or first turning, is a high. It's a time of optimism and enthusiasm. Our institutions are strong. The collective consciousness is, for the most part, moving in the same direction. The second 20 years, or second turning, is an awakening. Institutions are attacked. Nonconformity and social justice come to the forefront. It's a period of discovery and enlightenment. The third turning is an unraveling. Institutions are weak and mistrusted, and it's a time of individualism. And the fourth turning is a crisis. We're in one now. It's a period of upheaval. Throughout our history, America's history, each of these 80-year cycles have been remarkably similar. Let's go back 80 years, 1942. On the heels of the Great Depression, you get the end of World War II. 80 years before that, 1865, the assassination of Lincoln and the end of the Civil War. 80 years before that, the end of the Revolutionary War. And before that, the War of Spanish Succession in Europe. If you concentrate on the most recent generational turning, the one we're experiencing right now, we have to go back to the end of World War II, the period of 1945 to 1964, the first turning, our high, victory after World War II. It's a time when institutions are strong. The distribution of wealth is still fairly even, which means you could work a regular job and still afford to buy a house. It's a time of conformity, it was the era of rock and roll. It gave us Elvis, the space program, and muscle cars. Of course, it wasn't an all-inclusive high. There was still segregation, racism, and no protection for our LGBT community. Our high ended with the assassination of John F. Kennedy in November of 1963. The period from 1964 to 1984 was our awakening. Ironically, it's the period in which Mr. Jacks writes of this growing dissatisfaction or midlife crisis. During the awakening, institutions are attacked under the guise of personal and spiritual freedom. People start to grow tired of social discipline. We had Martin Luther King Jr., the Civil Rights Movement, the Gay Rights Movement, women's liberation, Vietnam protests, student protests, and Woodstock. We had great music, movies, evocative art, and literature and the first Macintosh computer. Our awakening ended with the re-election of Ronald Reagan. 1985 to 2008, we entered the unraveling. Things start to get tense. It's a period that stands in direct contrast to the high. Institutions are weak and mistrusted. We saw the collapse of the Soviet Union, the rise of hip hop, when black artists were illuminating the violence and injustice in the inner cities. We got Rodney King, the L.A. riots, O.J. Simpson, Columbine, September 11th, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The splitting of our national consensus took place and broke people's values down into red and blue states. All of it transitioned with the global financial crisis of 2008 and the war on terror. 2009 began the fourth turning, our crisis. We're in it now which is the tearing down and rebuilding of the nation's institutions. Neil Howell writes, In every instance, fourth turnings have become founding moments in America's history, refreshing and redefining the national identity. There's a quote from the book I'd like to read, and it's eerily haunting. History is seasonal, and winter is coming. The very survival of the nation will feel its stake, Sometime before the year 2025, America will pass through a great gate in history, one commensurate with the American Revolution, Civil War, and the twin emergencies of the Great Depression and World War II. The risk of catastrophe will be high. The nation could erupt into insurrection or civil violence, crack up geographically, or succumb to authoritarian rule. What's eerily haunting about that? is that it was written in 1997. 
So how do we fit into this pattern? Well, that depends on when you were born. You see, each generational block or turning defines those who were born within that period. There are certain archetypes. Those born during the high, the baby boomers, are the prophets. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, both were boomers, and both believed at a time when computers were expensive and rare that one day everyone would own a computer. Bill Gates even predicted an event like the COVID-19 pandemic five years before it ever happened. Those born during the awakening are the Gen Xers. These people, myself included, are the nomads. Strange how accurate that description is. The most famous of these nomads is Elon Musk. He builds things that move us from place to place. Rockets, cars, and not just cars, but future cars. That brings us to those born during the unraveling, the millennials. Strauss and Howe suggest the millennials will be the hero generation. They are the ones who will have to save the country. The future will be shaped by their values and aspirations. The Parkland High survivors, the September 11th generation, and the frontline hospital workers. These kids will emerge as our World War II heroes. If the trend persists when it's all over, our institutions will be radically different and rebuilt from the ground up in a way that works for the next generation or two. By explaining this pattern in such a clear way, this book has given me a sense of hope. It reminded me that all things are cyclical. Nature is cyclical and history is cyclical. And just like the great forests need fires and rivers need floods to remain healthy, Societies also need big events to clear out the debris and expose fresh soil so that a new generation can grow. These events set into motion the turning over of power and wealth from the old to the young, and they re-level the playing field. Though painful and destructive, Howe suggests it's the necessary cost for a new renaissance. I went down the rabbit hole and listened to countless interviews with Neil Howe, and his best guest estimates have us in a fourth turning for at least another decade. Even though the road between here and there is still fraught with peril and nothing is guaranteed, I was left feeling inspired about what's coming. The thought of being alive in a first turning high period, a new golden age, is invigorating, especially after the last 40 years. Maybe it's my own midlife crisis coinciding with the crisis we're all experiencing in the fourth turning. I'd love to use that as a cop-out, but I don't believe in midlife crisis. What happens between now and then is anyone's guess, but we've made it this far. And to wrap this up in a neat little bow woven from the relevance of the number five, I'll leave you with this. This episode now, it is through. Our history includes me and you, but it comes at a cost. So to end, I'll quote Frost. The only way out is through. Hey, thanks for listening. If you like what you're hearing, subscribe or follow us on your favorite platform. And spread the word because this show doesn't go anywhere without you. Find us at themindunset.com and on Instagram at the Mind Unset Podcast. All right, we are getting close to the end of season one. I can't believe it. Three more episodes, but we'll be back in November for season two, I promise. Next week is the last Strong Coffee, Strong Women episode of the season, and I am a little nervous. It's a special episode for me because I'm madly in love with my guest. Don't worry, my wife knows. In fact, my guest next week is my beautiful and fabulously talented wife, Melody DeCroce. We have two currencies in life, time and money. So no matter what you want to do, whether it's building a business, learning a new skill, solving a problem, you're going to spend one of those things. So when you spend time, you can save money. And when you spend money, you can save time by investing in the right tools to help you accomplish something faster. So time or money, no wrong answer, but only one of those you can make back. Okay, friends, we're closing in on it, man. I appreciate you guys for being here. And until next week, be nice, do good stuff. <laughs>